Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Murray Stokely, and I've uh, had the pleasure of working with Luigi for about 15 years now, off and on in the FreeBSD project, and I'm very happy that he was able to join us today to talk about NetMap. So with that, I'll just hand it over to Luigi. Thank you. So I'm from University of Pisa, and uh, I'm a professor there teaching mostly computer networks and something on operating system. The work I'm going to present today is about a novel framework to accelerate uh, packet I.O. In, uh, um, in operating systems. And part of this work has been done uh, together with my students, uh, Gaetano Catalli, Marta Carbone, and Matteo Landi. Uh, also, this work has been funded by the European project uh, called uh, Change, uh, which is about uh, uh, the, the design and development of a platform for flexible uh, flow processing. So the, why are we uh, discussing this, uh, this topic today? Because uh, for the past 30 years, uh, uh, we have been doing uh, software packet processing on uh, general purpose operating system for, for many things, uh, routing, uh, uh, packet switching, building firewall, uh, traffic analysis, network monitoring, testing, etc. Uh, the reason we are using these systems is that uh, they're, they're very convenient and provide a very rich uh, um, development environment. Uh, performance might be not that good, but uh, if, uh, if we are dealing with uh, low-speed networks, uh, that's not a big problem. And this is the reason why many uh, applications uh, have been uh, put uh, into production use uh, even on uh, FreeBSD, Linux, and systems like that. The thing is, uh, the network speed over the past 30 years uh, has increased by three orders of magnitude, uh, whereas the architecture of the operating systems has not changed. We are still using the, the same APIs to, to access the, the network uh, devices uh, with uh, raw sockets, uh, BPF, uh, PCAP, which is a wrap around uh, other mechanisms. Uh, within the kernel, we are still uh, using uh, uh, wrappers around uh, the uh, data buffers that are uh, managed by the network. Uh, interface, and all of this is uh, quite expensive in terms of uh, runtime costs, uh, makes it very hard to uh, cope with the uh, increased speed of the network uh, devices and the network links. Now, CPUs have become faster over the past 30 years, but there are some, some things that uh, do not scale. Uh, long ago, it it was possible to access um, memory location in one clock cycle. Uh, now you can do that uh, if uh, you are on, the, uh, on, a, on a register or a first level cache, not certainly on the memory that is on the main uh, bus of the system. So at 10 gigabit, uh, just to get an idea what what is the challenge, we have uh, about 14.88 million packets per second, one every 60 second nanoseconds. Uh, so how do we deal with, uh, with this? Either, either we put uh, faster hardware, dedicated hardware to, to do the packet switching and uh, whatever uh, we need to do with the, with the traffic, or we try to use the available hardware, hardware uh, the best we can. And in fact, the, the network cards that we have these days are quite powerful. Um, what have we got? What does uh, this uh, framework that I'm going to present give us? Uh, basically, this uh, is a snapshot of the performance that we can achieve. Uh, with NetMap, we managed to do line rate, which is almost 15 million packets per second, with just one core uh, running at around uh, 1.2 gigas, slightly less, slightly more, depending on the optimization that <coughs> you put in the system. And this is uh, almost, uh, well, probably more than one other magnitude than, faster than uh, using the standard APIs that are provided by uh, normal operating systems. Um, the, the system itself has very good scalability with uh, CPU frequency and number of cores, uh, as you can see from this graph. We'll discuss it in more detail later. And it has, uh, in my opinion, a quite uh, easy to use uh, API. Uh, just because we, we try to uh, get uh, hints from what the hardware does. In general, the hardware uh, uses very simple data structures because uh, it's, it's difficult to implement efficient hardware working on uh, uh, complex data structures. Um, 
the, the, uh, introducing a new API to do, to do stuff, to do packet processing, means that usually means that you have to rewrite a lot of software to, uh, to adapt to the new API. So we have built a libpkp emulation library on top our, of our API, and that simplifies life because many applications can just be run without any modification. You just take the binary uh, and run it on top of the new library, and you might have very good performance improvements, depending on the application. But we, again, we will see the, the details. How we managed to do that? Uh, in order to, to uh, see how, uh, we, we have to, see, uh, to look at the current uh, APIs to access uh, the network devices, uh, find out what are the, the problems with those API, show how NetMap uh, addresses this problem, and then we will introduce the NetMap API. Uh, it's in some details on its uh, implementation, performance data, and uh, we'll also discuss some experience, the experience in porting some application to NetMap. Because, uh, yeah, if the applications are written, uh, uh, written well, uh, then, then you replace the I.O. subsystem with a faster one, and you immediately get a nice speed up. If the application has other limitation, uh, which might be hidden behind the fact that the I.O. subsystem was low, then you replace the system and you still go slow, and then you have to investigate why. And then uh, in the end, we will discuss some future work. So what are the existing options for uh, doing packet I.O.? Basically, uh, I've listed them in the slide. Uh, you can do that uh, from user space, uh, which is very convenient because uh, you have plenty of uh, software libraries that allow you to uh, manipulate the traffic and uh, do logging. Uh, and also, you have a very, very nice tools for uh, software development. Uh, the problem is that uh, the mechanism just to pass packet from to, uh, to the, the kernel are quite uh, time consuming. Uh, you generally need a system call for every packet or for batches of packet. You need to do some data copying. And, uh, and this is just to pass the packet to the kernel. Once you are in the kernel, you still have some other, uh, some other things that are expensive, like uh, the, the fact that, that uh, data packets uh, are encapsulated by the kernel into the scriptors, which are lo allocated and they are allocated uh, for, each, uh, for each packet. And, and so, I mean, even, even that approach is not as fast at, at, as it uh, could be. On top of this, the kernel is a very dangerous uh, runtime environment. If you, your application is misbehaving, it might crash the entire machine. And, uh, and so, I mean, this is slightly undesirable for a production system. Um, there are other options uh, where you don't use the API that are supplied by the, gen by the operating systems, but uh, you take direct control over uh, the network devices. Um, for instance, Click is a, uh, uh, one system that does this, uh, it has the specialized device drivers which talk uh, directly to the uh, click elements, which are the, the components that you can assemble together to, um, to build a packet processing uh, system. There are other uh, proposals, for instance, uh, some uh, LibPickup uh, optimization that use uh, MMAP uh, or uh, uh, other I.O. mechanism to reduce the system call overhead, uh, they reduce the data copy overhead. There are, there are uh, systems which uh, allow you to access directly the network uh, device from user space, which means that you are playing with the register of the network interface. And this is as dangerous as programming in the kernel, because uh, this way you can write to random places in the, in the memory space of, uh, of the system. There is a custom hardware that has been produced. Uh, dark cards are very popular, especially in the uh, community that does traffic measurement. NetFPGA is also a very popular uh, option uh, for doing experimentation. It's an, F an FPGA which is programmable to do uh, some uh, packet processing uh, tasks. Now, uh, to see why internal operation is expensive, we need to have a look at the data structure that are uh, managed by the kernel and that are managed by the network interface card. And uh, on, on, on the left, uh, you see the data structure that are managed typically by network interface cards. Basically, most of uh, today NICs are uh, able to uh, process uh, uh, lists of uh, buffers and the internal representation is a circular array, which has a start and 
and the end pointer, uh, length uh, field somewhere, and uh, um, well, a base address because this uh, circular array is mapped in uh, main memory of the system. For each packet, we have a descriptor which has some fields uh, like a physical address of the packet, length, some flags, etc., and the buffers themselves are in main memory. The operating system. Uh, puts uh, some, its own descriptors, uh, attaches its own descriptors uh, to these data buffers, and these descriptors are, depending on the system, and buffs or SK buffs or and these packets, uh, and uh, they are typically uh, linked uh, in a list and uh, allocated and they're allocated uh, for each uh, data packet. And the use of the memory allocator is one of the most expensive operation in the in the lifetime of a packet, uh, at least within uh, within the kernel. So uh, what is the, the goal of NetMap and how uh, it tries to reduce the, the problems that uh, we have seen before? Um, the goal is to uh, do uh, packet IO efficiently from user space and uh, expose uh, this uh, access to the network card to uh, user space application. The way we try to achieve this, uh, this goal is to analyze the weaknesses of the existing APIs and try to remove them. And uh, basically, the, the weaknesses are uh, three, uh, the three listed there. The, there are system call costs, uh, that which we want to amortize at least. There are uh, data copy costs, which also we want to reduce or even uh, possibly remove. Uh, and there is the, the, the cost of uh, memory allocation that are done in the kernel and sometimes in user space that we can probably save if we design our systems in a slightly different way. Uh, the, the important thing that we learned in, the, in this project uh, is that uh, we should not be afraid of changing uh, big things uh, in, in the kernel of the operating system. Uh, I myself, but even other researchers, have been doing, uh, been trying to optimize the performance of packet IO for, for many years, and all the proposals seen so far are, are still uh, hitting the same limitations that uh, the internal subsystems uh, have, the, especially in particular the, the, the time induced by the device drivers. And so we, we struggled for a long time trying to get 10% uh, improvement, 10, 20% improvements or so, and we didn't realize that uh, the, the, the big hurdle was the uh, device driver itself, fixing that gave us the ability to um, get uh, very, very large uh, improvements. So many of these ideas have been proposed in the past. The fact is that they've been proposed separately. Uh, so we have the, some prototypes uh, which uh, do maps. Uh, we had some system which, which do direct control of the hardware, etc. All of these things have been proposed uh, in isolation, one from the other. And the collection part doesn't make a system. So uh, in, in a sense, uh, uh, this. Uh, this work could be seen as incremental, but I don't think it is. Uh, I don't think it is because there, there isn't anything uh, as fast as this one, as, as flexible as this one uh, in, uh, available today. Um, the, the, one of the goals also that we had is that uh, our system should be usable, uh, so it must have uh, an API that is simple and not error prone, and uh, it must be maintainable. Uh, it doesn't help that we build a system which is very fast but only works on a particular piece of hardware, because in two years this hardware will not be there anymore. The operating system support for that hardware uh, will not be there anymore, and, and so uh, our, our work uh, will be thrown away. Instead, we engineer the system in such a way that uh, if the uh, operating system changes or, or new devices come up, uh, etc. Uh, we are able, with a very limited effort, to, to port the or to adapt the, the, the system to this uh, modification of the environment and uh, still uh, have uh, the, the same good performance. So, what are the NetMap, the data structures that uh, we use to support the communication between the application and, and the hardware? Uh, the, the goals that we had were amortizing the system call costs, uh, reduce allocation, reduce data copies, and the hint uh, uh, to design the data structure it comes from the, the way the hardware uh, manages the data buffer and the list of buffers. They use a circular uh, ring of buffers, which is a very simple data structure. Each uh, uh, network controller has, its, has a different representation for this uh, data structure, the descriptor of the buffers, but in the end, they, they all contain the same information. Uh, 
basically a pointer to the to the buffer itself and the length and some flags. And so in NetMap, uh, we did a very similar thing. We uh, create a new data structure, which is called the NetMap ring, which is a shadow copy of the ring that is implemented uh, by the NIC. The important thing is that this NetMap ring is device independent and uh, it uh, points to in uh, some indirect way to the same buffers that uh, are reachable from, uh, from the NIC ring. And, uh, and so uh, the application can uh, manipulate the NetMap ring uh, in a way that does not depend on, on the particular device that uh, is in use. So we, we use the same API for a one gig or 10 gig or 100 megabit uh, card. The slots in the NetMap ring are very compact uh, because, uh, for instance, the address uh, of the card uh, is not a physical address. It's just an index into, into uh, an array in, um, in a shared memory segment, uh, which contains all the buffer. And these has, has uh, two benefits. First of all, uh, it's harder to make mistakes because uh, the, the index, on the index we can do bound checking uh, in a much more easier, in a much easier way. And uh, <clears throat> the, the index is also shorter than the typical uh, address size that, that we have. Uh, the other important feature of the network ring is that the ownership of this data structure is very well defined. Um, when you have a shared data structure, you, you have to protect access to this data structure unless you make the rules very clear and very simple uh, for its uh, uh, users. And in particular, for the network ring, the uh, Ownership, uh, the rules for ownership are uh, here. Uh, the global fields, uh, the uh, part in, in yellow on top of the figure, which are the uh, part pointer to the current slot uh, in, the, in the ring, and the number of slots that are available. Um, some other fields are, are read only, so they don't matter. And the uh, portion of the uh, of the array between current and current plus avail minus one, this is a circular uh, ring, uh, is uh, always owned by the uh, user space application, except when the user space application calls a, a system call. And we have basically a couple of system calls. Uh, one is Paul of Select, and the other one is uh, an IOCTL, which uh, uh, can be used to, to, to do um, non blocking uh, uh, update of this data structure. In, uh, all the rest of the structure, basically all the, all the other slots, are uh, owned by, by the kernel. So this means that uh, both the kernel and the user space application don't have to lock to access their part of the data structure. And the only time in which they um, interact is uh, during a system call and the locking is implicit because the user space application is not running during the, that part of the system call. And that makes access to the data structure very, yes. Sorry? Uh, yes, in a sense, yes. Uh, the other way to see this is that uh, the application can be multi-threaded, but uh, uh, we uh, we leave it to the application to synchronize access uh, uh, to the, this single individual data structure. How, how do you uh, use uh, uh, NetMap, this API? Basically, the, uh, you open a, a special device called that NetMap, and you get a file descriptor, which is similar uh, to uh, creating a socket, which is unbound. When you do that open, uh, the file descriptor that you get is uh, completely unbound. Then you issue an IOCTL, and the argument contains the name of the interface, plus some other parameters, and uh, we ignore them uh, at the moment. When you issue that uh, IOCTL, uh, you switch the interface from uh, standard uh, operation mode to NetMap mode. In NetMap mode, uh, what happens is that the data part of the interface is disconnected from the host uh, st uh, network stack. So all, all the packets uh, don't go anymore to the host stack and packets from the host stack don't go anymore to the, to the interface. Instead, these packets are, are just stored into the buffers uh, attached to the NetMap ring. And there is uh, one ring in, on the transmit side and one ring on the receive side. The buffers and the NetMap uh, ring are in a shared memory region and uh, 
on return from this uh, IOCTL, uh, you also get uh, information on the size of this memory region and on the uh, offset within this memory region where this uh, uh, data structure is located. On the picture, I have uh, multiple uh, netmap rings because modern uh, interfaces tend to have uh, many, many rings in order to uh, allow uh, multi-threaded application to access the network interface. But for the time being, let's, let's ignore the, them, that and think about a single uh, netmap ring. So uh, in order to transmit a packet, uh, basically the, the application knows where this ring uh, is, uh, knows the current uh, um, pointer, which is the first uh, buffer that we can use to transmit, and the number of buffers that are available for transmit. So it can start filling the, the buffers uh, and uh, set the length of each packet in, into the, the ring, and then issue a, a special IOCTL and IOCTX sync, which uh, tells the kernel that there are these new packets to transmit and uh, updates the, the fields of the network ring accordingly. On the receive side, uh, the process is similar, except that you first issue an IOCTL to ask the kernel how many packets are available, um, and then the kernel fills up uh, the uh, netmap ring with uh, the information on the packet and the current and available fields. And then the user space application can process the, uh, the packets. Of course, during transmit, uh, I mean, in this uh, stage, uh, when you are transmitting packets, you advance current uh, uh, every time you add a new packet to the, to the array. And, uh, when you are receiving packets, you advance current every time you consume a new, a new packet. So the next time you call the IOCTL, you also tell the kernel uh, that uh, you have already you have consumed some received packets and, and so on. And these uh, two IOCTLs are uh, non-blocking, so you can use them to pull the ring. Oh, of course, any any sane application will need uh, a way to suspend and synchronize uh, with events that. Uh, are generated by the kernel, such as uh, new packets, uh, incoming packets, or uh, buffers becoming empty and available on the transmit side. And, and for this, uh, we just use the standard mechanism that are uh, supplied by the operating system, poll and select, and they just work as expected. So uh, they wake up uh, whenever the avail field is greater than zero on the, on the ring that you are uh, using. Uh, you can use poll in and poll out as argument poll to decide whether you want to poll on the, trans uh, on the receive side or on the transmit side. Many uh, new systems uh, implement a mechanism called uh, interrupt mitigation to avoid that uh, the operating system receives too many interrupts due to the incoming traffic, and uh, NetMap uh, exports this delay to the uh, user space application. So if the card is programmed to send uh, uh, an in 10, 000, at most 10,000 interrupts uh, per second, uh, no matter how fast packets are coming, uh, the poll and select will not wake up faster than 10,000 times, 10, times uh, per second. And this is very useful to reduce the load uh, on, uh, on, on the CPU. Of course, I mean, there are some people uh, discussing NetMap told me, oh, yeah, but we care about the microsecond, uh, and uh, we, it's really important for us to react immediately. And you can always use the IOCTL for doing uh, busy waiting. Now, multi-queue and multi-core support. Um, many, as I said before, many mo modern uh, NICs have uh, multiple uh, queues. And the idea is uh, if uh, processing some packets on the transmitter receive side is expensive, you need to dedicate uh, multiple uh, threads to, uh, to the task. And if you have multiple threads uh, and only one, one queue, you need to synchronize those threads. And that's also expensive. That's why the NIC implements multiple uh, rings, both on the receive on the, and the transmit side. And uh, so this way, the threads can work independently without uh, synchronizing. Uh, this is completely supported by NetMap because uh, each uh, interface has uh, uh, multiple NetMap rings. And there is another data structure, which is this uh, light blue one, uh, which is called NetMap AF, uh, which contains uh, pointers to all the NetMap rings uh, uh, Attached to, attached to an interface. So basically, when, when you issue the LCTL to register an interface, you, what you actually get is, a point, is a, the offset of this data structure in, 
in the shared memory. From here, you get to know how many, how many rings uh, uh, you have in the system and the offsets to all these rings. And from these rings, uh, you have the offsets uh, to, to the buffers. All the addresses here are uh, position independent. Uh, so no matter where you map this memory area, you are still able to, to reach the data uh, structures. Um, how do you make use of these multiple rings in, in a context where you have multiple user threads? That's very simple because the um, IOCTL to register an interface in NetMap mode by default associates all the uh, rings uh, to a single file descriptor. However, you have a way to tell the, the um, the system that you want to associate a file descriptor only to one of the rings uh, supported by the device. And so if you, uh, there is a, the same, there is another ARCTL to ask the system how many rings are, are available. Uh, and once you know that, you can create uh, multiple uh, file descriptors, attach each one to a, sing, to a different uh, uh, NetMap ring. And then if you want to uh, associate uh, uh, a thread to a specific CPU, you just use a set affinity, which is a standard system code. So again, the user doesn't have to learn anything new. Uh, uh, what if the interrupts from that particular NIC ring are routed to a different CPU? Sorry? That, oh, OK. You, you're asking, uh, what if interrupts are routed to a different CPU? You, you would need a system to ask uh, uh, the operating system what is the routing of interrupts uh, for each uh, of the queue. If you want uh, um, to preserve locality of the yeah, data structure. The TX Sorry. The same goes for TX completion. If I put my, if I send my packet and I put it on my mm. So TX completion is less of a problem because the typically the rings are quite large and and. Uh, you, the system is structured to give you an interrupt not on every packet, but uh, every half a ring or something like that. Uh, what, what you care is to have a few buffers available to do the transmission. You don't care too much if the completion signal is given uh, once every half a ring instead of every, at every packet. Connection with the host stack. I said uh, that when you are in NetMap mode, the uh, card is disconnected by the host stack. However, we don't want to rewrite the device driver from scratch. We don't want to rewrite all the mechanisms to control the interface. For instance, uh, uh, how to turn uh, link up and down, change uh, the speed, uh, change the hardware address, etc. And so as far the, as the operating system is concerned, the card still exists, is still there, is able to send and receive packets. Uh, all the control mechanism uh, work, uh, the IOCTL uh, still work uh, as in normal mode, uh, IF config uh, still works in normal mode. The only difference that that packets coming from the host stack uh, end up into an additional netmap ring, which is used, uh, um, which is visible through the same mechanism. And the packets that uh, the netmap client wants to send to the host stack should be stored in a additional netmap ring, and then from there, the operating system, when you do the next IOCTL or poll, passes the packet up. And so basically, you use the same mechanism for everything, for packets coming from the network and from packets coming from the stack. And if you want to preserve the uh, connectivity of your machine, you just have to program your application in a way that, uh, uh, for instance, on the receive side, intercepts the packets that it is interested in, and then passes them um, passes them to the uh, appropriate uh, transmit ring that goes to the host stack. For instance, you, you can write a firewall in this way. And on the, on the other direction, packets coming from the stack end up into in, uh, a, transmit and a receive ring for NetMap, for the NetMap client. And the NetMap client can decide whether to pass the packet to the network or do something else, like do traffic shaping, uh, filtering of some kind, et cetera. Uh, as I said, the mechanism is the same. Uh, you have a map to access the ring and, and the buffers. Uh, you use IOCTL to do non-blocking IO or Paul to do uh, uh, blocking uh, IO on, on those uh, rings. Example of use. I mean, I said the, the API is simple. And I'm trying to show that uh, in practice uh, with uh, an application. This is a, 
the code from our test application, which is a traffic generator, which can actually do line rate at 10 gigabit per second. And basically, uh, we, we use a simple setup with only a file descriptor attached to all the um, rings in the, in the card. We open the device, uh, uh, copy the name of the card we, we want to set in, net, uh, in netmap mode into the uh, argument for the RSTL, register the, uh, the interface, uh, memory map the region um, and, the, and also compute the uh, address of this uh, uh, light blue data structure, the network uh, IF pointer, and then uh, start a main loop where we pull uh, the file descriptor and uh, we, if we have uh, slots available from transmission, we try to fill all the slots uh, available in all the rings. So we have uh, two nested loops, one on the rings and one of, on the uh, slots uh, available. Compute the address of um, the buffer and we get, we use one of the macros defined by the API to do that. Store the payload into the buffer, set the length into slot, advance the, the ring pointer. This is just modular arithmetic and that's all. And when all the rings are full, the uh, Paul uh, will, uh, at the same time, uh, tell the, the system that there are new packets to transmit and wait for uh, new uh, uh, buffers for the next round of uh, transmission. And on the receive side, you can do something very, very similar. Uh, you notice that we have overloaded the Paul uh, with uh, at least a couple of functions. Uh, one is the, you know, checking uh, whether buffers are available, and the other one is tell the, the system that uh, there are new packets to transmit. And that's actually one of the things that uh, uh, is important to achieve very good performance at high data rates. I mean, the system calls tend to be expensive, even on fast machine. Uh, they, they take between 200 and 500 nanoseconds each. So having an extra system call in a loop can, can give a severe, a severe slowdown into, into your uh, application. How do you deal with multiple interfaces? Uh, so the idea here is that uh, all the uh, netmap rings and data structure for all interfaces in netmap mode are in the same uh, shared memory region. Uh, which means that uh, uh, a single uh, thread uh, can do things like uh, packet forwarding or routing uh, or even uh, fi implement a firewall uh, without uh, even doing memory copies. Uh, you just need to switch the uh, buffer indexes between the receive ring and the transmit ring and, and you are done. And uh, this mechanism is also very convenient if you want to pass packets between the uh, the network link and the host uh, stack. Because once again, once you decide that the packet is acceptable, uh, you can just uh, move the index without uh, doing the data copy. Now, data copy is problematic not because of the time it takes to do the copy, because these days um, the memory buses are quite, are quite fast. But uh, it's problematic because uh, it uh, pollutes the, the cache. And so if you are uh, moving around a lot of data, if you have many interfaces with many uh, uh, many rings and large rings, uh, you you risk to uh, use completely your level one or level, even level two cache, and so the overall performance of your system will suffer a lot. That's why I think it's it's uh, useful to uh, avoid uh, copies as much as possible. Now, safety. Uh, this is uh, an area where uh, I got some criticism. People say, okay, you have this, this mechanism, which is very fast, but uh, the user space application uh, can corrupt packets uh, uh, that have been generated by other, um, by other threads or by, uh, by other processes. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, you have to compare. First of all, I mean, you can remove these uh, um, this danger by uh, avoiding uh, the use of shared memory buffers, and and that means that uh, you run into an extra data copy cost, which is not terrible. And um, when when we did our tests and also comparing the performance of NetMap with other systems, the reason we go so much faster than others is that we remove the uh, encapsulation that is done in the kernel, the mbuff and skbuff. They're really expensive, much more than the data copy. Uh, 
Uh, the other thing is uh, you should compare what Net NetMap does uh, with the alternatives. And the alternatives are running uh, tasks uh, directly in the kernel, which is equally dangerous. Uh, sorry, you, it's even more dangerous because you can overwrite not just the, the buffers that are used to store data, but you, you can overwrite any, any piece of memory owned by the kernel, so you can crash the system. NetMap cannot crash the system, and a misbehaving NetMap application at most can corrupt uh, data packets. And uh, the, other, the other approach that some people use are direct control of the NIC, so applications are not running in, in, in the kernel, uh, they're running in user space, but uh, they are still, you know, playing with the NICS register, and the, the registers of the NIC are also in charge of controlling DMA, DMA to uh, memory areas. So again, they can overwrite any, anywhere, uh, any part of the system memory. So it's equally dangerous. So I think the, the, it is it's true that uh, this mechanism is unsafe. However, this mechanism is meant to be used by trusted applications. And uh, again, I mean, the alternatives uh, are even more dangerous than, than this one. The, some of the things we plan to do in, in the future is to implement uh, um, an extension of these NetMap rings uh, called the virtual rings, uh, where uh, they, there, is a not, there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, NetMap ring and, and the hardware ring, but instead multiple uh, virtual rings uh, that have the same uh, data structures and uh, APIs are multiplexed into uh, single physical rings uh, doing copies uh, so that should provide the uh, necessary isolation and safety uh, to, to the system. Of course, uh, it will be more expensive, less performant, but um, that uh, should be useful to do, uh, for instance, to, to support virtual, uh, virtual machine. And when we do that, uh, we also need to find out, devise some mechanism to do the, the multiplexing of uh, incoming data packets because, uh, and, and once again, I mean, might be that the answer to this is very simple. We just multiplex based on the uh, destination MAC address, for instance, to uh, tell traffic uh, belonging to different uh, uh, virtual machines. Uh, one of the things that we want to explore is whether we can do this uh, in a user space process instead of uh, doing doing it into the kernel. Of course, this will involve uh, communication between different user space processes, and we have to uh, measure how, how expensive are, are those uh, uh, communication and whether we can uh, run them as fast as the, uh, uh, as the system calls that we use for NetMap. A uh, few notes about the implementation of the, of the system. Uh, the current prototype is on FreeBSD. Uh, FreeBSD head and Relangate. The code is very, very similar. And it's very small. Uh, it's uh, about 2,000 lines of uh, code uh, heavily commented for the uh, NetMap uh, device, the POS and IOS CTL support routine. And then there are a few uh, device-specific uh, patches um, that uh, are structured, uh, we'll see in the next slide, but there are, there are about three or 400 lines for each of the devices that we want to support. The API is very simple. Basically, a user space application will include uh, these two headers, uh, 400 lines in total, and kernel drivers will uh, in include uh, these two plus, actually, we only include the netmap.h plus netmapkern.h which is also very small. In user space, you don't need anything. I mean, the, the, the sample application shows uh, how to use the, uh, the API to do a packet generator, and also a receiver is very similar. Uh, we have written a very small uh, LibPickup uh, wrapper, uh, which is, again, less than 1,000 lines of code, and that uh, enables porting uh, many, many applications with no change at all. Uh, the code is designed to minimize the changes to the operating system. As I said in the introduction, we want to be able to survive uh, uh, modification uh, to the operating system, introduction of a new device, and also to survive myself if I decide to quit working on this. I mean, I hope that someone else will be able to, to catch up. And in fact, we, we, had, uh, already, we had already a couple of um, users who contributed the uh, device drivers um, modification for things that we didn't uh, support. The, each device driver uh, should uh, implement uh, these uh, four uh, additional methods. Uh, one is very simple, basically, tells the system 
tells the device what to do when you register the interface in Netmap mode. Uh, there is one that exports the, the lock to the uh, generic uh, routines, and there are two that implement the synchronization between the hardware rings and the Netmap rings on the transmit and the receive side. And the modification that are done to the uh, original uh, sources for the device drivers are basically uh, like this. Uh, at the beginning, we include the common file, and then we have a small modification in the ring initialization uh, routines, uh, both for the transmit and receive uh, side. And then the interrupt service routines, uh, when we are in NetMap mode, uh, become just a cell wake up. We don't run, we don't do anything in in the interrupt service routine, but uh, wake up the any any user space process uh, which could be waiting for the uh, for events on the on the interface. So that's very easy to to import into existing uh, uh, drivers. And also, if the driver changes, chances are that uh, we will not have a conflict in uh, in the diffs. Mm -hmm. Two things to note about the implementation is that the devices in NetMap mode are insensitive to LiveLock. Uh, LiveLock is a phenomenon that uh, was experienced when network uh, devices become uh, faster and uh, caused the, the CPU to spend all of its time uh, processing interrupts and with no time left to do useful work. So uh, most modern hardware implements a mechanism called interrupt mitigation where the uh, uh, the interrupt service, the interrupt is not generated faster than a programmable rate. Mitigation has a disadvantage because uh, it also delays the notification of, of events to the kernel or to use the user space application. So ideally you would, would like uh, the mitigation delay to be very, very low, except that uh, if you make it very low, the, the load on, on, the, on the system uh, will increase. With NetMap, uh, we actually don't need mitigation because the interrupt service routine only notifies the user space application. And whenever you, the user space application is ready to process data, it will do so. So when the system is overloaded, the uh, user space application presumably will uh, run uh, with uh, longer intervals. And when the system is unloaded, the, the user space application will run immediately, which is exactly what you, what you want. And so the system remains perfectly controllable even under severe overload. Um, also, the pollen select routines are optimized for the common usage patterns. There are many applications uh, using pickup, for instance, which uh, call uh, polo select uh, even in an unnecessary uh, situation when it is known that there are packets already available for processing just because the application is uh, uh, poorly, poorly structured. So we optimized uh, this case and uh, basically whenever a poll is called uh, with a veil greater than zero, the, uh, the interaction is log free. Of course, we still have the system call cost, but uh, internally in the, in the NetMap code, uh, we don't have any, any expensive uh, uh, operation. Um, two more things. Um, when, when you run an application uh, using Paul, uh, you, you can specify whether you're interested in the transmit ring or the receive ring. And uh, there are cases where, you're, yes, you're interested in the transmit ring, but for instance, you're implementing a, a bridge or a router or something like that. So you also want to send out packets that are uh, queued on the interface. However, uh, you don't want to be woken up uh, whenever there are buffers available on the transmit ring because all you care is to send the packets uh, that are already queued. And so the, uh, the poll routine is uh, implemented in such a way that uh, by default, at least, you can override this, uh, this option. Uh, whenever you uh, call poll, you also send out any packets that are queued for transmission and you don't wake up uh, the, uh, when the, there are slots on the, on the transmit side. The other thing is many lib pickup applications uh, expect to find a timestamp uh, attached to, to the packets in, in some way and they don't work properly if the, the timestamp is not there. So producing the, the timestamp is not a task that NetMap uh, should uh, implement. However, not doing so would mean that uh, you would have another system call at least per, uh, per iteration on uh, your event loop. 
And again, it is expensive. So we decided to put an option in NetMap so that uh, whenever uh, Paul is called, uh, and, sorry, whenever Paul returns, it also updates a timestamp in the, in the NetMap ring. And then the application can make use of it uh, without uh, the overhead for the extra system call. The code for LipCap emulation is very, very simple. Uh, basically, there are two interesting methods in LipCap, one to send packets, which is, which is called pickup inject, and one to receive packet, which we'll see in the next uh, slide. And then there are 50 different uh, functions to access the device at configuration. Uh, we, we have implemented the LipCap emulation uh, with the stubs for all these uh, routines that, uh, yes, are used by the, the linker, but uh, not really important for the application. Uh, the two important routines are pickup inject, which implement uh, here. It takes uh, as an argument a uh, pickup description, a buffer, and a packet size, and we just uh, map that uh, to uh, the NetMap API, finding the first available uh, slot in one of the rings associated to the, um, to the interface, sorry, to the NetMap uh, descriptor. And uh, pickup dispatch is the other method uh, used on the receive side. Uh, this is uh, uh, rather well engineered. I mean, the, the original API is well engineered because it uh, lets you specify a callback that it should be applied to a batch of packets, and you can specify how many packets you want to uh, process at most. And uh, using this API, uh, we implement it uh, on top of the NetMap ring. And we don't need to. Uh, we don't even need to do a data copy because we can apply the, the callback directly on the on the data buffer, which is uh, uh, pointed by the NetMap ring. Performance. So when when we talk about uh, packet processing, uh, the most of the cost is in uh, as a per packet component, as opposed as as opposed to a per byte component. So the relevant metric is to measure the throughput in packets per second, not in bytes per second. So you, you find many, many papers uh, which report uh, bytes per second because uh, it's easier to, to get uh, good performance. I mean, you just make the packets larger. But uh, the, the problem is that when you have a real application like a firewall or a router, etc., it might, I mean, the best way to attack the system is send, send it uh, very small packets. So we really care about the packets per second throughput. Uh, we measured the uh, performance of NetMap in a few different configurations. First of all, uh, individually uh, transmit, transmit uh, packet or, or receive packets, uh, and then we measured the packet forwarding in different configurations, and then we tried to port uh, a few applications, and we list a couple of them here, uh, open with, with switch and, and click, and see how it behaves uh, without map, NetMap, so in the original configuration, and with NetMap. All the, experiment, uh, report, the experiments reported here are with an Intel dual port uh, 10 gig card, an Intel uh, i7 870 CPU, which is, I mean, a nice one, but not too expensive, not top of range. Uh, we also support a number of one gigabit uh, per second cards, but of course, the, mar the numbers there are not so interesting. Uh, a few warnings. I mean, when you do measurement, you know that the measurement conditions are really important. Uh, and uh, he, in particular here, what we try to measure is the, the time that it takes to bring the packets from the wire to the application or from the application to the wire. It doesn't make sense to uh, do the measurement with uh, an application which is very uh, computational intensive, like uh, doing IPsec or doing having heavy uh, uh, data processing on the packet itself, because we would measure something else. Uh, of course, I mean, CPU-intensive application will benefit less from a, an efficient I.O. mechanism, but uh, that's not what we are trying to uh, achieve. The other thing is that there are many cards which cannot actually do line rate uh, irrespective of the CPU speeds. And uh, basically all of the cards, well, I haven't seen many cards, but of the about 10 cards I've seen, different models I've seen, all of them have uh, some kind of limitation one way or another. Um, basically, writing software is difficult, but probably building hardware is even uh, harder. Um, what uh, things that uh, might affect uh, the performance of the system beyond the CPU speed uh, are the uh, 
performance of the buses, uh, the depth and um, size of caches, uh, of course, CPU and memory speeds. So uh, the, the, when, when, uh, when you do this kind of measurement, measurements, it's very important to understand uh, what might be causing, uh, what might be the bottleneck in, in, in your system. Anyways, I mean, the, the code is available, so it's very easy to, to test uh, uh, your cell phone on your specific hardware. So the first thing that we see is the transmit throughput versus clock speed, and this is basically the first graph that I, uh, I showed, and this is, uh, these numbers are from uh, an, ex an example that we distribute in our code, very, very similar to the listing that we have seen. Uh, in this experiment, we uh, change the CPU, uh, the clock speed, uh, from, uh, in our case, from uh, 150 megahertz to the top speed, which is 2.93 gigahertz. And we see that uh, the uh, transmit rate increases uh, quite linearly up to the uh, maximum uh, rate supported by the link. This point in this measurement was about at about 1.3 uh, gigahertz. Uh, we have done some optimization since then, so the actual uh, uh, saturation point is now at uh, 1.2 or slightly below 1.2. If we and that maps to 70 to 80 clock cycles per packet in, on the transmit side. On the receive side, we have similar numbers. Um, if we increase the number of cores. Uh, uh, increasing the number of cores mean, means uh, dedicating one core per uh, netmap ring and uh, using the ability of the, um, the hardware to uh, have uh, lock-free access to these uh, two uh, rings. Uh, we get a very good uh, scaling of uh, performance. This is almost twice as fast as the original uh, one core implementation, and with uh, four core, which is all we add in our system, we do line rate at 450 megahertz. So this is not uh, exactly four times faster, but uh, about 3.3 uh, or something like that. Uh, as a comparison, I mean, FreeBSD, a packet generator on FreeBSD, unmodified, uh, goes at around uh, 700,000 uh, packets per second. So it's here in the noise. And all the re results reported also for Linux using the stock drivers are all uh, in the one to two million packets per second, respective of the number of uh, CPUs. Things are different if you use uh, click or, or other things, but, but still, I mean, the, the numbers that you get are around the four or five million packets per second. So this is way, way faster and using only a fraction of the, of the CPU. And uh, uh, by the way, because we have this interrupt mitigation mechanism, uh, once we get to the uh, top speed, uh, the CPU usage uh, uh, decreases as you increase the, uh, clock, uh, the clock speed. Now, the second experiment was uh, uh, changing the so-called burst size. So our generator run, runs in a loop. Uh, and in the example that we have seen, it tries to fill the, the ring uh, before uh, completing the iteration. But of course, we, we can terminate, uh, we, we can invoke uh, the, the poll more often, and the burst size is exactly the number of packets that we send at most before invoking uh, the poll. And this experiment, this experiment uh, shows uh, how expensive is the poll system call. And, uh, for instance, uh, in this bottom curve, uh, which is with only one ring and uh, one core, uh, we see that uh, if we call Paul every, for every packet, uh, we get about 2 million packets per second, which means that basically all the cost is in the Paul system call, uh, which is about uh, 500 uh, nanoseconds. If we increase the number of packets per iteration, of course, we go faster. And then here, for instance, we, the, the limit speed that we achieve with uh, one um, ring is about uh, 12 million packets per second. This seems to be a limitation of, uh, of the hardware. Uh, changing the hardware, to, uh, reprogramming the hardware to use two uh, rings uh, still with one core uh, achieves uh, the uh, line rate, uh, which is 14.88 uh, uh, million packets per second, even with a burst size which is reasonably small. Of course, I mean, the CPU occupation is higher when, when you use uh, uh, smaller bust, uh, bust sizes. On the receive side, uh, 
NetMap is able to do line rate, and as I said, the performance is similar. However, this is one of the cases where the hardware has uh, some issues, and uh, it works uh, well at some packet sizes. Uh, for instance, 64 bytes uh, works perfectly and does line rate. 128 works fine. At other packet sizes, the hardware is unable to do line rate. And why we blame the hardware? Because if we do the, reduce the clock size, um, we still see the same performance. That means that the application is not uh, uh, CPU bound. And actually, uh, the, the issue might be related to the way the NIC writes to the PCI bus. Uh, probably transactions are multiple of 64 bytes. And so in order to, do, uh, to write to memory packets that have uh, different sides, that, that is not a multiple of 64, they need to do multiple transactions. And this is why they go slower. Um, could be. Forwarding performance, uh, okay. Forwarding performance um, using a, a simple program which takes from an interface and send on the other one using the NetMap API, just one core, does uh, 10.66 uh, million packets per second. If you tell NetMap to compute the timestamp, the timestamp takes a little bit of time and you go down to 9.42 million packets per second. If you use the LIPIC emulation, you go down to 7.4. Five. If you use FreeBSD bridging, it's one tenth of this, just to have an idea of the difference in performance. Uh, we are short of, a bit short of time, but uh, I mean, porting application, uh, as I said, if they're using lip pickup, it just means that you can run the application on top of the different lip pickup. And uh, if the application is well written, it will just go faster. Some application have issues. For instance, uh, we are trying to open with switch. Uh, uh, which is uh, a system that does uh, packet f bridging uh, and uh, it has a forwarding module running in user space. Uh, the, native, the original code uh, did only 75, 65 million packets, uh, thousand packets per second. We were able to bring it to 3 million packets per second, but with some modification to the application. Click user space, uh, click is also a very popular system. Uh, the original code only did 400,000 packets per second on overly pick up. With NetMap, we managed to do almost 4 million packets per second. I'll skip these two slides. Um, but And uh, just a mention of related work. Uh, there are, as I said, various mechanisms have been proposed in the past. Uh, many of them uh, still use the encapsulation made by the driver, for instance, NetSlice, net PFRing, uh, various pickup implementation. And so they, they don't go as fast as NetMap. Uh, Click-based prototypes uh, use custom device drivers, which are still very similar to the original one with SKBuff. So again, they don't go, uh, they don't go so fast. Uh, there are some proposals which uh, take direct control of the hardware and uh, they achieve the same performance as NetMap, but uh, if the uh, user space program is misbehaving, it can crash the entire system. Plus, the API to use those uh, applications is much uh, harder. Um, the one proposal that is very similar to ours is the packet shader IO engine. Uh, it has more or less a similar uh, data structure similar to the one used by NetMap, uh, uses the IOCTL to synchronize Canon and user space. The IOCTLs here are blocking, and uh, there is no support to select fall. There are no pickup emulation, and it only supports uh, one particular version of the Intel 10 gig uh, driver. So it's very difficult to update to newer drivers. Availability of the code. Uh, NetMap on the, my own page is the home of the, uh, of the software. I uh, keep it continuously updated with new software releases. So you also have uh, bootable images uh, based on Pico PST. So you don't need to install anything on your system. You can just run the image to see how it performs. There are a few papers, uh, pre a few presentations, including the slides that I presented now. There's support for FreeBSD header, read and gate. Uh, Intel 10 gig and 1 gig cards are supported. Realtek uh, uh, 1 gig cards are supported. And I'm getting a contribution for, by several users uh, on, for different drivers. 
And uh, future work, uh, well, there are boring tasks, but they're useful, like doing uh, small performance optimization, doing prefetching of the data fields uh, to uh, reduce the latency in accessing memory, support more cards, uh, port and fix application, because as I said, not all of them um, can enjoy the benefits of a faster li library. And the Linux port is something that we plan to do. And fortunately, there, there aren't many uh, OS-specific uh, APIs that are used by NetMap, so the work shouldn't be too hard. And then uh, later we try to explore the implementation of per-user virtual rings to let even non-root processes uh, use NetMap and uh, hopefully go faster. And then port uh, bring subsystem to user space. For instance, um, uh, I wrote the uh, IPFW firewall on FreeBSD and SX. That's a nice candidate to be brought in user space and use NetMap. I did a similar work already a couple of years ago, so it should be uh, straightforward. Uh, many, many operating systems use uh, internal routing, and there are proposals for advanced data structure to support uh, IP lookups, uh, and that would be a very good opportunity. The availability of NetPort is a very good opportunity to uh, experiment with those new algorithms. And that's the conclusion. We can do 10 gig uh, li at line rate and user space without uh, any magic. Uh, we have to thank uh, the Change Project for supporting this work, Intel Research Berkeley which has been closed recently, but uh, they funded part of this work. Uh, my students, Gaetano Catali, Marta Garboni, and Matolandi, who helped uh, with the, these uh, uh, parts, of, by, by these parts of this work. And that's all. If you have questions. Yeah. Um, so, well, I just said I did the net slice work. So um, I think it's, it's a nice piece of work. I think the, the issue that I see with this line of work is the fact that it's been so well trodden. It's been essentially beaten to death. And the reason why I say this is because something very similar has been done um, by NetApp. So I think Jose Bustoloni in 2000, he did um, something uh, in the lines of what, what, what uh, NetMap does in the sense that he had a big static uh, chunk of memory which was mmapped by user space applications. And that chunk of memory essentially contained the mbops. Um, so there are some differences. And in fact, they actually, if you look at the paper, uh, he had a similar API to pull over uh, file descriptors. And, and uh, he used a very similar way to talk to the host network. Um, anyway, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's an issue with the line of work because I've, I've, uh, I've encountered it as well. But um, I think, I think it's really interesting, and I think you should focus, in my opinion, on how to scale it out, not how to scale it up, right? CPUs do not scale in frequency anymore, right? So we, we keep shaving off cycles off of every single packet processing you know, uh, path. But I think what's, what's needed is how to uh, use a, an array of slow cores when you have to deal with a very uh, high-speed NIC, and then NICs already went half of the way in the sense that they offer you multiple NIC queues, right? So then, um, yeah, I, I think uh, that that could be a future direction in which uh, you can advance. And this is also go to the mic. This is also why I, I try to avoid that to introduce any any kind of uh, synchronization mechanism between threads or processes in the, in the system. And then the other thing is again being a well drawn there's a George Porter at UCSD is using uh, a, like Myricom's MX, I think, API, which is also a, a way to sidestep the, the kernel and use the you know zero copy way to, to talk to the Myri. Uh, okay, if you have time, we can talk a little yeah. bit of, about but, that later. But yeah. yeah. So okay, so there was another question. Yeah. So the question is uh, whether we can exploit the ability of NICs to timestamp uh, packets as they arrive on the wild. Uh, 
probably yes. Uh, at the beginning, I tried to avoid any any feature that would be available only on specific NICs because otherwise the system would become very slow for for the other NICs. So I, I'll explore that uh, in the future. I have to say I'm not a believer of uh, very precise time stamping of packets. So that's that's a feature that. Uh, for my opinion, can can wait until someone else decides to implement it. Okay. What a question? Yeah. Yes. So, repeating the question, we had uh, high-speed I/O paradigms for audio and video back uh, in the late 90s, and actually I was involved in that because I used to write uh, device driver for FreeBSD for audio devices back in 96, 97, and I hated the use of uh, memory mapped I/O for for that because the speed constraints were not uh, so strict at the time, and uh, I think I mean. For, for video and audio, the uh, timing constraints are not as strict and is, and as in this case. Uh, for, for video, we are, we are talking about milliseconds, and for audio, more or less the same thing, um, perhaps 100 microseconds. The fact is that uh, for networks, we are three-ordered or magnitude uh, below. So yes, as much as I would like to avoid memory mapping and all these tricks, probably there is no way to do without them least with the current packet sizes. Perhaps uh, if uh, in the nectar of the future the minimum MTU becomes uh, 1,500, uh, who cares? Uh, you, you will see a packet every 100, uh, sorry, every mi microsecond or so, and you will be able to manage it with the standard uh, IO mechanism. But uh, at this stage, I don't think that we can do without, uh, without that. Okay. Other questions? No. Okay, I think we are done. Thank you.